Well, take your Bibles, please, and turn to the New Testament book of Hebrews. It's on page 1001. If you're using the black pew Bible that's in the pew rack in front of you, book of Hebrews, near the end of the New Testament. Once you've found Hebrews, turn to chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great, high, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we need to hear from Christ. We know that this word we've opened together is the word of Christ. We know we need to see Christ. We think of what Paul said to the Galatians, that in the preaching of the gospel, Christ was displayed before them as crucified. We need to have Christ displayed before us today in the preaching of the gospel. We need Christ to fill our gaze. So please help us as we come to the word of Christ. By your spirit, cause us to hear the voice of Christ, to see Christ from the word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you know that I'm a big football fan, but as much as I love football, baseball is really my favorite sport to watch. I've been to dozens and dozens of baseball games, and when I've gone to games in college or professional stadiums, I've always seen signs and heard warnings that say, Pay attention to the action on the field so that you lessen the risk of getting hit by a foul ball. There are signs that say that. The public address announcer makes these announcements. I've even seen that warning printed on the tickets that you get to go into the stadium. It's always kind of been a curious thing to me. I confess that the signs and warnings are even needed in the first place. Seems like you wouldn't have to remind people who've come to a baseball game who paid to be there to keep their eyes on the field. I think baseball is a beautiful game to watch. I think even the field is nice to look at. Nevertheless, between your phone and the hot dog guy who's going up and down the stands and the people around you, it's easy to get distracted. So it's a good thing that these stadiums offer so many reminders that you ought to keep your eyes on the field. Because these foul balls that come screaming off a bat can seriously hurt you. They can even kill you. 
And of course, you're much less likely to be hit by one if you're always keeping your eyes on the field of play. Reminders at a baseball stadium to be always looking where you ought to be looking are really helpful. They can save your life. Now, when you open to Hebrews just a few minutes ago, you can imagine this book as a sign, an announcement that reminds you to keep your eyes where they ought to be so that you don't face the risk of serious injury, even death. So where is it that Hebrews tells us our eyes should be pointed? And what does this book give us as motivation to keep our attention where it ought to be? What kinds of things might serve as distractions to you to turn your gaze away from where it should be? And what's the danger, really, after all, in looking other than where you ought to be looking? Well, those are the kinds of questions that the book of Hebrews is going to provide you with answers with over the next several months as we work our way through this book. But let's start in this overview by considering some background material for the book of Hebrews. So turn over on your bulletin outline to the side that says the all-surpassing sun at the top. Just going to quickly work our way through some of this background material and get us oriented to the book of Hebrews. Now let's start by saying that the author is an unknown. Of the 27 New Testament books, Hebrews is the only one for which there isn't overwhelming evidence from the early church about who wrote it. If you know anything about Hebrews, you're probably already aware that the question of authorship is one of the biggest mysteries of the New Testament. As I've put on your overview, we know that whoever wrote it knew his Old Testament very well. We're going to see that as we go along. He knew the audience very well. And he knew their circumstances. He knew what had been going on with them. And apparently the writer knew Timothy. He mentions Timothy in chapter 13, verse 23. Now, all those facts might cause you to conclude that Paul wrote Hebrews. Certainly he knew his Old Testament. Certainly he knew Timothy. But there was enough disagreement in the early church about whether Paul was the author of this book that we just don't have enough data to lock down on that idea. So we say the author is unknown. The good news is that the interpretation of this book doesn't change if we were somehow able to conclude that Paul wrote it or some of the other folks who've been put forward, Luke or Barnabas or Apollos. As to the book's audience, based on how much it makes reference to old covenant elements like Moses and the priesthood and the sacrificial system, you think about references to all these people in the Old Testament in that Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11, references that aren't accompanied by any explanation, all of that should cause us to conclude that we have an overwhelmingly Hebrew audience. We don't know where the audience for this book was. Maybe they were in Rome because of chapter 13, verse 24. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Maybe this audience was in Jerusalem because of how much the writer says about the tabernacle in this letter, which could later have been applied to the temple. Of course, the temple was in Jerusalem. We just don't really know where the audience is. And then when was it written? Well, certainly it was written sometime during the first century A.D., but it was probably written before A.D. 70. A.D. 70, you might remember, is when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. And the reason why I'm saying it's likely prior to A.D. 70 is because it seems like if the temple had been destroyed by the time the author wrote, then obviously the sacrifices would have been forced to end because there was no temple. And it seems to me that the author would have mentioned that since he's going to be making the point in this book that the need for the old covenant sacrifices had ended. And if you're sharp, logically you'd say, but Mitch, that's an argument from silence. And you're right. So we don't know when the book was written, but I think it was probably prior to A.D. 70. All of that's background material. And you're thinking, boy, Mitch, you've just spent a lot of time telling us about three things you don't know for sure at all. <laughs> and it's true, it's kind of a gift I have. 
But let's talk now about some things that we can lean into based on what the text of Hebrews gives us. You'll see that I regard the occasion of the book, that is, what prompted its writing, as persecution. Apparently, the book's recipients were being persecuted for their faith. If you still have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 10, look with me at verses 32 through 34. The writer says, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your own property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. So they'd suffered, they'd been reproached, afflicted, imprisoned, they'd had their property plundered. There doesn't seem to have been much in the way of martyrdom yet. 12.4 says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Nevertheless, this audience certainly had been persecuted, and it seems that at least part of the trouble that the writer is addressing is a temptation in this congregation to revert back to the old covenant and to stop identifying with Christ so that they could avoid persecution. So the writer exhorts them in chapter 13, the last chapter of the book, to go outside the camp, to go to the shameful place with Christ and to bear the reproach that Christ endured because some of them were demonstrating a wavering in their desire to be identified with Christ and to endure the suffering that would attend that identification. That seems to be the occasion that prompted the writing of this letter. So when we consider the purpose, we're asking the question, when the author thinks of the situation that the audience is in, how does he go about responding to that situation? And you'll see that I've said in the purpose that in response to the situation that the audience of this book was in, the writer extols Christ as the fulfillment of and thus as superior to the old covenant and its types and shadows and intermediaries. And he warns the recipients of the eternal danger of not trusting in Christ's high priestly work alone to reconcile them to God. And that purpose then, the purpose that again is the reason the author wrote in response to the audience's situation, their occasion, that purpose is reflected in the theme, as I've put it in the overview. What is it that Hebrews is about? Well, as I understand it, Hebrews is about Christ, who is the all-surpassing Son of God and mediator of the new covenant, who alone has made atonement for his people through his sacrifice his offering of that sacrifice, and his ongoing intercession for his people as our great high priest. To turn from trusting in Christ alone for salvation, therefore, is to face God's terrible judgment. That's what I understand the overall message of Hebrews to be. And then beneath that, as we briefly scan the outline, and the outline is how the theme works itself out in the book, we're going to see how the writer holds Christ up to his audience as surpassing all of these old covenant types they were being tempted to return to instead of persevering in their faith in Christ. First, he holds Christ up as surpassing angels. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Then the writer holds Christ up as superior to Moses. Then the writer praises Jesus as superior to the Old Testament priesthood. And finally, the mountain from which the Lord Jesus reigns is held up as superior to Mount Sinai, which is the place synonymous with the Old Testament law, with the Old Covenant. Again, this outline fleshes out the theme because the book of Hebrews is the author's multifaceted attempt to display how Jesus is superior to all the elements of the Old Covenant to which his audience was being tempted to return to escape persecution. Well, now you're experts on Hebrews. Job well done. But if you were to take all the ways Christ is presented as all-surpassing in Hebrews and you were to boil them down to their essence, I think the essence of Christ's superiority as he's displayed in Hebrews is that he's mediator of the new and better covenant. 
So turn with me to the other side of your sermon outline. We're at Roman numeral two now. Jesus mediates the new and better covenant. And that reality that Christ is the mediator of the new and better covenant plays itself out in Hebrews in several ways. One of those ways is by showing the insufficiency of the old covenant. Remember, it's the old covenant system that the audience of Hebrews was being tempted to turn back to. So you can see why the writer is very desirous to show them why going back to the old covenant would be such a foolish move. And one of the ways he makes that case is by demonstrating the insufficiency of the priests that mediated the old covenant. Turn with me a couple of chapters back to Hebrews 8, where this idea is front and center. The insufficiency of the old covenant's priests. Chapter 8, let's pick it up at verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they, all, they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Do you see the connection that the writer of Hebrews is making in these verses between the new covenant's superiority to the old covenant and Jesus' priesthood being better than the old covenant priests? These old covenant priests are insufficient because they mediated a covenant that's enacted, based on the language from verse 6, on inferior promises. The new covenant is enacted on better promises. Thus, the one who mediates that covenant as a priest, is superior to the ones who mediated the other inferior covenant as priests. Now let me just stop here for a minute and answer a question that maybe some of you are asking. And if you aren't asking it, it would be a good question for you to be asking. The old covenant isn't inferior to the new covenant because God was really trying his best with the old covenant, but it didn't work like he planned. And then he took all that he learned from his mistakes in the old covenant and made a new covenant. This one's going to be really good this time. No. The new covenant is better than the old covenant because the old covenant was designed by God to be inferior to the new covenant. It was never designed by God to be the end. The old covenant, the law of Moses, was our tutor, as Paul puts it in Galatians, to get us to Christ our Savior, the great high priest. So it isn't a knock on God that the old covenant was inferior to the new. Rather, in his wisdom, the old covenant was always designed to give way to the new. Ancient planned obsolescence, if you will. And God's plan has worked absolutely according to his unsearchable design. Not only did the old covenant that the writer, again, is warning his audience not to turn back to, not only did it have insufficient priests mediating a lesser covenant, the old covenant also called for the offering of sacrifices that were insufficient. Insufficient priests, insufficient sacrifices. Go back with me to chapter 10 where we see this idea play out. Let's start reading beginning at verse 1, Hebrews 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, 
make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So the millions of animals slaughtered, burned, eaten, their blood poured out and sprinkled during the time of the old covenant, first at the tabernacle, then at the temple. Their blood never took away sins. It was impossible for it to do so. And now Christ comes into the world, the writer of Hebrews is telling us here. And he's telling us that these words that he quotes from Psalm 40 are ultimately Christ's words. Notice that he says, when he comes into the world, he said, verse 5. So the writer of Hebrews is telling us, when David speaks in Psalm 40, these are ultimately the words of Christ. And right after that, the writer tells us that the sacrifices of the old covenant were insufficient to remove sins. And he tells us what was sufficient to remove sins. What's Christ referring to in verse 7 when he tells the Father, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. What was the will of the Father for the Son? Was it not that the Son should save his people from their sins? What does the angel tell Joseph to name Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21? You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The will, behold, I've come to do your will, verse 7. The will that the Son came to earth to accomplish was to redeem God's people, to atone, to atone for our sins and to reconcile us to God. And how did he do that? Not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by the blood of a lamb, the lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus offers a greater sacrifice than those offered by the old covenant priests because when he's offering the sacrifice, he's offering himself. He offers his own blood, Peter says, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Jesus is both the only sacrifice that ever removed sin and paid for sin, and he is at the very same time the great high priest who offered that spotless sacrifice. On the cross, your priest was your sacrifice, hanging in your place, dear brother and sister, suffering God's wrath as your substitute, and satisfying completely your sin record toward God so that you could have peace with God and so that you could be his very son or daughter. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. So maybe you're asking, why would God tell Moses to command that the Israelites make all those offerings if they didn't do any good? Let's be careful now, because I didn't say they didn't do any good. They couldn't forgive sins, yes. But for those Israelites who offered those sacrifices as the obedience of faith, each drop of blood poured out by those sacrifices testified to faithful Israel of the promise they had placed their faith in. That there was coming one whose blood would cleanse them from all unrighteousness and make them right with God eternally. Righteous Israel, faithful Israel, offered sacrifices not so that they'd be forgiven, but as the faithful response to the fact that they had been forgiven by faith in the promise God made to his people, made to Abraham to save them by means of the one who would come and be pierced for their transgressions and crushed for their iniquities. It's true that the old covenant sacrifices themselves couldn't remove sin. But offering those sacrifices in accordance to God's law and seeing those sacrifices as pointing to the true sacrifice that was coming according to God's promise, that was what genuine faith looked like under the old covenant. 
Don't be confused on that point. The third way we'll talk today about how the writer of Hebrews holds Jesus up as the mediator of a new and better covenant is by demonstrating how the old covenant's power was insufficient. Insufficient priests, insufficient sacrifices, insufficient power. Seems like we're just sort of skipping back and forth between chapters 10 and chapters 8. And you're right, I do want you to go back to chapter 8. And this is, this is from the passage that I read to start the sermon. Turn back with me to chapter 8 and let's look again at verses 10 through 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. This new covenant, which Jesus seals with his blood on the cross, actually causes God's laws to be in the minds and hearts of his people we see here from Jeremiah 31. That's where this quotation is taken from. That's not talking about knowledge when he talks about the law being in minds and hearts. That's talking about obedience. The new covenant recipients are made empowered to obey the Lord, whereas we were powerless to do that before. The old covenant was powerless to cause us to obey God. In fact, one of the reasons for the old covenant, one of the reasons for the law of Moses, was to convince us of our utter inability to obey God's law and to cause us to throw ourselves upon Christ for mercy and forgiveness. So the new covenant, unlike the old, actually causes us to walk in God's statutes and obey his rules, as Ezekiel 36 puts it in talking about the new covenant. And look at verse 12 again. This new covenant is a covenant of mercy. Those who are made participants in the new covenant, unlike those who participated only in the old, experience God's mercy toward their iniquities and the complete removal of God's anger toward them for their sins. So the new covenant is mediated by a better priest. It's sealed by a better sacrifice. And it gives its participants real power to obey the Lord. The conclusion the writer of Hebrews wants his audience to draw. And that God, who's the real author of Hebrews, wants you to draw. Is that there's no need. It makes no sense. It's the height of foolishness to turn away from Jesus to anything else. But how else does the writer of Hebrews call his audience not to let go of their faith in Jesus? We've already seen the insufficiency of the covenant, that the recipients of this letter, again, were being tempted to turn back to, to avoid persecution. We've seen how that makes Jesus the mediator of the better covenant, but let's consider how Jesus mediates that covenant. He he mediates it, as the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us, as a son. And his sonship is first seen in contrast to angels. And we're going to get into that in chapter 1 and 2 of Hebrews. And you may be asking, what do angels have to do with anything? Well, again, he's holding Jesus up as the superior son, the all-surpassing son. Maybe you remember that in Job chapters 1 and 2, Angels are referred to as sons of God. So the writer wants to show that Jesus' sonship is superior to whatever sort of sonship angels have. But I think also built into the thinking of those to whom this letter was written, Jews in this day believed that God's angels had some kind of intermediary role when God delivered the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. We see that reflected, for example, in Galatians 3. Paul says there, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. So Paul says 
The law came from God to Moses on Sinai through angels. When Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is rebuking in Acts 7 the Jewish religious leaders for their lack of faith in Christ, he addresses them as, quote, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So the author here wants to make clear to his audience that whereas the old covenant, remember, that's the contest here, old covenant versus new covenant. Whereas the old covenant came to Moses by means of angels as the sons of God, the new covenant has been mediated by the Son of God, whose sonship far eclipses that of angels. That's what chapter 1 is laboring to make clear when the writer quotes Old Testament passage after Old Testament passage, showing that Jesus is the unique Son of God in a way that angels, as part of God's creation, could never be. But his sonship doesn't eclipse only that of angels, but also that of Moses. Now, these are fighting words when the writer of Hebrews is going after Moses. He's going after one of the key figures in the Old Testament. Moses is the one who received the Old Covenant. He's the only one that God permitted, you remember from Exodus, to go up on Mount Sinai to receive the law. Moses is the one who was permitted by God to look on God himself, the back part of God in Exodus 34. Exodus 33 says that Moses and God spoke face to face as a man speaks to a friend. But not even Moses mediated the old covenant as a son the way that Jesus mediates the new covenant as the eternal God, the son. Look at chapter three with me where the writer makes this case. I hope you're detecting a pattern here of how Jesus is surpassing everything to which these Hebrews would have been tempted to return. Chapter 3, look at verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Yes, Moses was faithful, but as a servant. Christ is faithful as a son. He's superior to angels. He's superior to Moses, both of which were bright lights in the old covenant constellation, but Jesus surpasses them both. And so the message is, stay with him. Don't turn back. And as we survey Hebrews this morning, the last way we'll see that the writer glorifies Jesus as the mediator of the new and better covenant is as the great high priest of that covenant. The priests of the old covenant were descendants from Jacob's son, Levi. They were, dis- they were in the tribe of Levi. They were inferior to Jesus as our great high priest in every way. First, as we've already seen, they offered sacrifices that couldn't forgive sin. They mediated a covenant that couldn't empower obedience. They had to offer, the writer says, sacrifices over and over and over again, including sacrifices for themselves for their own sin. Their priesthood is no match for Jesus's because Jesus isn't descended from Levi. He's descended from Judah. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And his priestly order isn't after the order of Levi. It's after the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to talk more about Melchizedek when we get to chapter 7. But for now, it suffices to remember that the high priests who descended from Levi were imperfect and impermanent, but not the high priest that's after the order of Melchizedek. Go with me to chapter 7, Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, verse 17. The writer says, for it is witnessed of him, meaning Christ, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Skip down to verse 22. 
This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests, that is those in the old covenant, those descended from Levi, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hallelujah. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy Innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So because Jesus' priesthood is from the order of him that's said in verse 3 of this chapter to have neither beginning of days nor end of life, because Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, his priesthood is forever. Unlike these Levitical priests who died. And unlike the Levitical priests, Jesus was perfect with no need to make sacrifices for himself, though he himself became a sacrifice for his people stained as we were with sin. What's the takeaway from the fact that Jesus is the mediator of this new and better covenant? The takeaway, as I've been saying, is so don't turn from Jesus. If he is the mediator of the better covenant, don't cease following him to return to the lesser covenant. And to drive that message home, the writer of Hebrews peppered this book with multiple grave warning passages in the outline of the book that I've given you. I've underlined those warning passages. And the upshot of those five warnings is this. It's not just foolish to turn from Jesus back to the old covenant. It's not merely a bad idea to turn from Jesus back to the old covenant or to anything else. Because some of you in this room are like, yeah, I'm not really tempted to turn from Jesus to angels or Moses or the sacrifices or the priests. So fill in the blank for you. Whatever you're tempted to abandon Jesus for the sake of, it's not just a bad idea. It's to suffer eternal damnation. Turning to just one of these five warning passages will prove this point. Go back with me again to chapter 10. Verse 26 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment, do you think, will be deserved by the one who's trampled underfoot the Son of God? Trample underfoot Moses? That's one thing. That's bad enough. You trample underfoot the one who's greater than Moses, the Son of God, and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. How much worse punishment do you think he'll receive? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing, beloved, to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you hear how the writer describes leaving Jesus and returning to law keeping for salvation? He calls it trampling underfoot the Son of God. He calls it profaning the blood of the covenant, the blood, Jesus says, with which he inaugurates the new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, he said to his disciples. It's the blood of Jesus. The writer calls that outraging the spirit of grace. And to do that, to leave behind Jesus, to turn from Jesus to anything else, is to fall into the hands of the living God, which ought to be for you a fearful thing. And if it isn't for you, it doesn't change the fact that it is a fearful thing, an eternally fearful thing. So why the warnings? Are the warnings there so that people who've truly been saved somehow don't lose their salvation? 
Or are the warnings just, you know, it's October, Halloween's coming. Are these warnings just kind of like the people who dress up in scary costumes in a haunted house? They really look scary, but they aren't actually scary. Is that what these warnings are about? No. These warnings are real. And while, yes, it's true that we believe that, that no one who's ever genuinely been born again will lose his or her salvation, nevertheless, these warnings are here to keep us who profess faith in Christ, to keep us sober-minded so that we don't fall away and thus reveal we were never truly Christ's to begin with. That's the role of the warnings, briefly stated. But how do you make application of an overview of Hebrews? How does Hebrews affect your Sunday afternoon and your Monday morning? I think the overarching applicational idea comes from the sermon title, which I've borrowed from Psalm 2, Kiss the Son, Lest He Be Angry. The whole of that verse in Psalm 2 says, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. And there's the message of Hebrews, and that's the application. Kiss the Son. Revel in the Son. Adore the Son. Don't turn away from the Son. Listen to the Son. Glory in the Son. Because if you do, turn away. As he's going to tell us in chapter 6 and in chapter 10, there's nowhere else to go. Nowhere else to go but hell. There's nothing else, and there's nowhere else, and there's no one else. It's Jesus or eternal destruction. And it's not Jesus for a while. It's Jesus all the way to the end. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Or to use Hebrews 12 language, let us be looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So how is it in big picture terms that we look to Jesus so as to love and adore him so that we don't turn from him and thus be destroyed by him when he comes to rescue his people and take vengeance on all who've not trusted in him? How is it that we look to Jesus so as not to face his wrath? Well, in the same way that you look at anything you want to see, you look at whatever you want to see where it may be found. So let's answer the question, where can Jesus be found? Well, he can be found in his word, the Bible, which means you ought to be in your Bible. Daily is good, but aim for regularly. I've used a one-year plan, a two-year plan. Sometimes it feels like I'm using an eight-year plan, a psalm a day. Whatever you can do, do. But being in your Bible isn't a solo sport. Looking to Jesus by looking for him where he may be found Recognizing that he's found in his word at least includes being here on Sunday morning. Because this word is the word of Christ. And so when we preach it, the voice of Christ is going out, calling sinners to himself and sanctifying his people by his spirit with the word. And so adore the son, kiss the son by being often found gazing at him, looking unto him. And you gaze at him by gazing at his word through engaged church participation, through personal reading. How about through community groups? I met with our community group leaders last Monday morning, and I told them each week, whether it's a study or a prayer and share, let's be opening the word. Simply being an engaged participant in community groups, which start this week, that's a way to look to Jesus, to adore him, to grow in love for him by seeking him where he may be found because he's found in his word. Now, this overlaps with my first application point concerning the word some, but do you know where else Jesus says he is? He says he's where his church gathers. In Revelation 2, Jesus is referred to as he who walks among the seven golden lampstands. What are the seven golden lampstands? 
the uh, rest of Revelation 2 and 3 tell us. They're the seven churches to which Jesus tells John to write. Jesus walks among these seven congregations. And there's no reason to conclude that he doesn't walk among every true congregation. And I'd regard ours as a true congregation. Therefore, to look to Jesus, to look for him where he may be found, is to prioritize being where his people are gathered. Prioritize this gathering, which consists largely of those in whom Jesus dwells by his spirit. If you want to gaze at him, which is what the writer of Hebrews is calling on you to do, be looking unto him and prioritize this gathering. Sunday morning is really a Saturday night decision. That means organize your social calendar and your sleep schedule and your work life, whatever it takes, so that you can look on Jesus where he may be found, and he's found among his church. I wonder if in your home there's a referendum on church attendance every weekend. Don't reconsider church attendance every weekend. Decide now that you'll be found where Jesus can be found by his spirit, and that's, where his, that's with his gathered church. Now I know, as a preacher, the risk I run when I exhort you to be found in the word and to be found with the church. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to say that. I've heard that 10,000 times. Be in the Bible, be at church. Now let me just stop for a minute here and ask you whether you think I've just told you something boring or ho-hum. Have I bored you by encouraging you to be in the word and to be with the saints if you want to be looking unto Jesus? Do those exhortations feel old hat to you? Because let me tell you what I'm doing when I'm calling you to do that, brother and sister. I'm calling on you to the least boring, most marvelous practice you could ever imagine. Because let's be clear, when I'm calling on you to gaze upon Jesus by his word and his people, I'm calling upon you to gaze on a beautiful sight. I'm not wanting you to be in the word and in church so that you can check a box. I'm wanting you to be in the word and in church because that's where your Savior meets with you. And I love you and I serve you and shepherd you well by directing you where your soul can be satisfied by adoring your great God and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a loving thing for me to tell you where Jesus may be found and to exhort you to look on him there, to look on the all-marvelous, all-surpassing Son of God. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He's holding up Jesus as all-surpassing so that you might see his majesty and power and excellence and be satisfied and captivated so that you wouldn't be tempted to turn away from him even for a nanosecond. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Those who do fall, those who fail to worship the all-surpassing son all the way to the end will perish in the way because his wrath is quickly kindled. So my brother and sister, be looking unto him. Consider his magnificence. Gaze upon him. Seek him where he may be found all the way to the end. He's the superior son, the superior sacrifice. He's the superior priest. Hold fast to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son. He is excellent, marvelous beyond description. And while you had no business whatsoever making him known to us, you've done that. You've let us come to know you by your son. You've allowed us to be known by your son. And so we thank you that we don't have to be under a covenant that is powerless to cause us to actually obey you, but rather we can be under a new covenant inaugurated by the blood of your spotless son. Help us to gaze at him, to marvel at him, to be satisfied by him our whole lives long. We pray in his name.